So good afternoon, everyone. A special thanks, of course, to all the speakers whom I will be presenting in just a little while. Um, as you know, this uh, webinars that are organized by WOW, World Anthropological Union. Um, well, I, I'm I'm the, the organizer of the webinars together with the colleague from uh, IUAES, Felipe, and um, this is a joint organization of. WCA and IOS, so they are called now the World Anthropological Union webinars. Well, we started this back in during the pandemic, back in 2020, and they were staged every month, and then they became um, uh, twice uh, a, a bi monthly event. So it happens more or less, more or less every two months. Sometimes one week later, sometimes one week earlier. Well. Anyway, we've discussed many, many issues on these webinars, and today's topic is going to be artificial intelligence and anthropology, which is, of course, a very, very wide topic, but we'll manage. If not, we'll see if we can later um, organize a second webinar on the issue, if we feel that it needs to be discussed further. I want to thank, of course, um, all our colleagues in the steering committee of WOW, which means the the board of WCA and the board of IUAS, and of course my colleague Felipe uh, Fernandes from Brazil, who's organizing this with me. And I also want to thank Ricardo Faguaga, who just left, who is our IT person, and Michel Bouchard uh, from the University of British Columbia, as well as everyone else in the in the board uh, that made this possible, and everyone that gave suggestions for names of people to be invited and for questions to be. Uh, discussed. So basically, um, well, often a webinar is not easy to organize because it's hard to get six or seven people together because everybody has their own schedules, each one is in a different part of the world, so it's always a bit complicated, so I apologize for that, but we made it, we're here. And what is interesting also is that today's webinar has a major uh, component of people who came from HUMA, from uh, South Africa. Um, and so I think the, well, HUMA is the Institute for Humanities in Africa. And we have several of the participants who are either still engaged in this HUMA Institute or have previously been there. So I will present you all very briefly, and then we'll move on to the webinar in itself. And the way this will work is I will give the, the floor to each one of you, and I will ask you to speak uh, five minutes tops each one. We'll do a first round, then we'll have a second round, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience, which are generally asked either through the chat or people can go on a live. I, I, no, I, I don't want to make any mistake here because I'm not sure whether in this Zoom webinar format to prevent hackers, if we can actually have the people asking questions alive. If not, we'll just go through the chat, okay? So I'll present you, I'll just follow the order that is in my screen. It's probably, it might not be the same that you have, but well. So Leah Junk is an anthropologist. She was, in, she was um, at Huma right on, until very, very short ago, shortly ago. And she's an anthropologist fascinated with questions of what the integration of computational technologies into people lives means for our ability to relate to one another and envision a shared future. Uh, she has um, she has also been working in the, um, in the South African Journal and her work in journalism and as a consultant convinced her that storytelling and a new framing of digital literacy are central to dealing with accelerated change that is going on in today's world. Then we have uh, Natalia. Natalia is a founding member of the Latin American Network of Digital Anthropology, where she advocates for critical research on technology to understand the region better. Currently, she's an editorial assistant of the journal Big Data and Society, NPR manager of the Committee for the Anthropology of Science, Technology, and Computing from the American Anthropological Association. You are in Chile, right, Natalia? And uh, her main interests are infrastructure studies and, inter and telecommunication governance. Then we have Amina. Amina Alawi Sulamani is a doctoral research fellow at HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa. 
and a final year doctoral candidate. So I'm sure you'll make it. <laughs> Both at the University of Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Her current research is at the intersection of STS, medical anthropology, and investigating human technology interactions in hospitals and feminist ethics of care, especially in regard to biotechnologies and future hospitals in Morocco. Then we have Maya. Maya, am I saying your name correctly? Yeah. Maya Ohebrun is Associate Professor of Anthropology, Technology and Organization at the Department of Educational Anthropology, Danish School of Education, Aarhus University. She is the editor of the Palgrave Handbook of the Anthropology of Technology and has conducted ethnographic research related to emerging technologies for more than 10 years. Her current research focuses on professional AI practitioners and enactments of expertise in AI development projects and the role of generative AI and LLMS in higher education, especially in teaching educational anthropology. Last but not least, we have Aza Ahmed, whom I thank very much for being here since you are in Ramadan and Thank you so much, because I know it's a, it's not an easy, it's not a normal time, it's not easy. She's an SDG postdoctoral fellow also at Huma, University of Cape Town, and she's part of the Carne Carnegie Corporation of New York funded project, Future Hospitals, the Force Industrial Revolution and the Ethics of Care in Africa. Her work focuses on AI deployment in Ghana's healthcare system, Examining Mino Health AI Labs, uh, based in Accra, Ghana, and that specialize in automating, automating medical diagnosis, prognosis, and disease prediction, including COVID, malaria, breast cancer, tuberculosis. So the aim of this project is to make an effort to democratize quality healthcare through AI-powered solutions. So we have a panel of women, yay. And uh, we will start, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll just use, since you're all placed, normally I start from east to west, but I think some of you are not placed right now where I said you would be from, uh, from an institutional point of view. So I'll just follow the, the order of the screen. So I will start with Leah. Uh, we've met already because of a project we're working on together, but thank you all. All of you, thank you very much for participating on this, and I'm sure we'll have a wide audience and it will be a lively discussion. So, Leah, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the invitation. I believe I can speak to any of the questions that were sort of shared in advance and um, I think it's important to speak about how um, artificial intelligence might affect um, anthropological research um, and, you know, how we look at the future, how we look at the present and also at the past for that matter. Um, I think um, as anthropologists, we have to be prepared to um, move past the distinction between big data and thick data. I think it's a distinction that's no longer very useful and we have to take into account all the things that happen around us that involve large data and technologies. Um, ultimately, technologies and data are modalities that we, we cannot escape. Um, politics are informed by large data. Every dayness is informed by it. Um, so to an extent, we depend on this way of seeing and, and describing the world. Um, I think it's a problem. What I see a lot in um, my consulting work is that a lot of the discussion is around looking, especially outside of anthropology, looking at technologies as self-contained entities um, with you know, their own logic and a sort of um, unilinear purpose. And I think the good thing is that we as anthropologists are trained to problematize this data. Um, and data is always problematic, right? It's never neutral. It captures a particular point of view and there are always is interests um, that are tied to it. So I think where our superpower lies um, is in connecting the different technological repertoires um, to both the context and broader um, developments and discussions. Um, but I, I do also think that it requires us to be a bit us. Um, I'm, I'm speaking as though we are 
a monolith, but um, just because it's easier, um, to be a little bit more bold and, um, you know, open to, to rethink our methodologies and to play around with them. Um, I think it wasn't mentioned in the introduction that I'm um, chair, I don't know if I mentioned it, um, I'm chair of the Commission of Digital Anthropology uh, with the IUAS. It's it's a new um, platform and I'm hoping, um, yeah, I'm hoping to make this new platform a bit more public today and we'll share the details about it in the chat. Thank you so much, Leah. Yes, I, I forgot to mention two things in the introduction or in the opening. One of them is that Divine Fu, the director of uh, Huma, was meant to be with us, but he had something coming up, so he can't make it. That's why we only have a we have a female panel. And the other thing is, normally I read the topics that we have that I have sent to the speakers, uh, and I didn't do that. But it's basically Leah already uh, mentioned it. There were three or four questions, really very general ones, the idea that AI may be potentially scary. And are we as anthropologists correct in worrying about it? Aren't we already having lots of robot voices and substitutes? Is, meaning is AI really substituting humans, which is of course, uh, the main objective of our, of our discipline, right? It's to, to, to look at humans. And then again, what is the difference between AI from what we already have and how might AI affect or influence anthropological field research in the future? I think this is important. And then the last thing that that one of the members of our board, Ed Lebo, uh, mentioned was the fact that uh, there is a thorny ethical issue or issues in plural involving the development of large language models that has to do with materials used to train these models, the nature of biases built into the models because of the materials selected for using training and also the ownership of the intellectual property embodied by these materials. So Head's idea was to, to, to see if the panels could discuss, the panelists could discuss how best to resolve the tension between the broadest possible materials training base and the need for consent of the intellectual property owners before using them, which of course is a tricky, <laughs> a tricky aspect as, as uh, Leah has already mentioned. So let's move on to Natalia. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much for the, this invitation. I'm super excited to be here. And one of the prompts that really, really just invited me to this conversation was talking about if anthropologists should be scared or worried about artificial intelligence. And first, in my case, I specialize in governance and infrastructures, which will be my viewpoint. And from that perspective, artificial intelligence is a concern. And like any other technology, AI enhances our capacities, particularly our skills to organize, process information, and more. But all over the world, there are regulatory black holes because on these topics, technology is always in front of the laws and people invent things before the, the regulatory things are made, are created, and plus there is only so much you can anticipate with digital systems. And in the case of telecommunication, for example, the first laws uh, to regulate the telegraph, the, the telephone were invented several decades after the technologies already existed. And today society has advanced and reduced the time frame, but the law is still super slow to regulate these topics. And it's super worrisome to put a technology in the world without having the, the general guidelines, ethical guidelines on, on how to use them and their ton of potential to do harm and to figure it out the harm as the technology is put available. And that's, and that's a really very complicated thing to deal with. And also, it's worrisome to put a technology in the world while making the system behind it and thinking the system through. And the systems underlying IA require a list of materialities to work and keep the data flowing. For example, they require more cell phones, more antennas, more data centers, more computers, more undersea cables, sky cables. And when we pass the technologies, these technologies to matter, 
and what people like me see is the structure of more natural resources, for example, lithium, copper, and more, and your cell phone batteries most likely uh, have the material sources sourced from places like Chile. And the cost of maintaining that connectivity and maintaining that data flow and your connectivity to Instagram, your connectivity to social media and more technologies means communities left without water to maintain the data centers, to create the, the lithium, means communities uh, with contaminated water, means the salt lakes in Chile right now, means unique ecosystems and natural reserves being destroyed. And maybe I might sound a bit apocalyptic, but this is currently happening, like it's a reality at the moment. And I invite you to read more on the environmental impact of lithium extraction in Chile. And also you have to consider, for example, energy. Energy is like the mother infrastructure for any digital system. And you have to consider the water consumption to keep the data circulating and to keep the data center cool. And you need more plastics to make more technologies, more IoT technologies. And just it's something that just piles up and piles up. And I have not even mentioned the labor conditions and the global supply chains that make these technologies happen. And from this, per this perspective, a very material and infrastructural perspective, AI is super worrisome. And you can see that it's more than a tool. It's more than something you can ask something and it will give you a recipe to make the things on your refrigerator, or is something more than making funny memes about Kate Middleton <laughs> or where she is at the moment. So for me, uh, it's important to just to question what artificial intelligence is doing, and also to question what type of per perspectives we can give to anthropology to qu make and ask questions. How much technology do we need? And also how we can use technology more responsible. And in that level, the discussions around ethics become more important and even more important for anthropology as a discipline that has ethics at the core of its practice. And finally, I just want to say that when we see these types of topics, and again, from the particular perspective that infrastructure studies give, the industry, big tech, will keep being for profit the state will aim always for connectivity. All states do this. And um, in, in countries like Chile, connectivity becomes some, something so important that it's a core mobilizing value to aim for development. So it's something that you the really connectivity and the state have things that they go together. The users will expect more connectivity. And in this landscape, academia needs to maintain a critical stance. And if you can't say something, is that technology should at least be used responsibly. Okay. Thank you very much, Natalia. So next is Amina. Amina, I suppose you are in Cape Town. Uh, yes, exactly. Hi. Hi. Yeah, thank you, Clara. Um, and thank you for organizing this um, really interesting conversation. And I guess a lot of our thoughts are, are very intersectional in terms of what was said. Um, so I really agree with Natalia and also what Leah said. Um, so I did my field work um, in an oncology clinic and spent several um, months as well with AI software engineers. So I guess my perspective is really coming from a medical space, but also being in an AI lab and being in a tech um, environment. And I, I very much think the skeptical or the skepticism is very much demanded and needed in these conversations, because just in as much we're sort of living in an era of an unimaginable time, um, I think our fears need to be placed um, or, or we should create um, sort of space for our fears just as much um, because we're still trying to actually figure out what's what's happening. Um, so I think the idea of fear or um, whether we should be afraid of AI, I think the word AI is kind of too broad and very big. Um, and I find it very useful, for instance, when I'm thinking about medical technologies and foreign technologies in, um, Af in, in the Moroccan hospital, for instance, to actually locate the AI components within the larger machine to actually understand the technicalities of 
um, of what is at hand or what does the particular AI component do in this larger um, sort of radi radiotherapy machine, for instance. And from there, sort of try and draw larger questions or more precise questions. Um, and so I, I don't want to speak about my fieldwork too much, but just observing the radiotherapy machine, for instance, the medical imaging was very interesting to um, pay attention to. So this was a foreign radio um, therapy machine that was brought in from the US. Um, and, I, and I guess the types of questions that are demanded from us to ask are very different um, beyond the human machine interactions it's more of like the data flow and where is this medical imaging going does someone else have access to it will it be used to build other data sets and other biotechnologies which will later and um, be sold and i do think that several biotechnologies are are moved by market logic um and you know as we've learned in terms of research method with anat singh capitalism is incredibly messy and with the outsourcing of, of labor as, as natalia said um where the data is stored in terms of data centers an ethnography of artificial intelligence that would actually sort of follow this entire trajectory seems kind of impossible um because of the non well because of lack of resources unless you have like great funding to actually like follow all these spaces where uh, where the AI where the AI components has been developed or like who the software engineers are um, but I think what is really concerning at, or, or to keep in mind from what I've um, from what I've seen in my field work is the amount of um, waiting time um, biotechnologies or foreign biotechnologies that are brought into African hospitals create and the kind of waiting time for repair and maintenance um, that introduces itself to the patient, which, you know, was reliant on the medical doctor to come and see the medical imaging, see what's wrong, fix um, the, the radio, the x-ray and, and move on. And I think it's these gaps that are actually interesting to think about what gaps is technologies with AI sort of creating in people's lives and how our local ethics of care changed by virtue of having to sort of respond to the demands of the software if it's an interface. So the patient would be told, well, sorry, we can't have you like walk into the um, surgery room before you actually, you know, pay before we create a whole file for you. And I know these kind of electronic health records already existed in other spaces, but all softwares are being linked to new AI components in medical spaces and they're sort of coding patients and trajectories. And I think there's there's a lot of gaps where people's lives are eventually um, at stake when that happens. Um, so in terms of research method, I do think about it as a multi-sided ethnography um, that is com incredibly complicated because of the, the amount of opacity that exists in the ways in which those, um, those softwares have been put in place um, where the original code has been um, done. Sometimes the clinical trials for certain technology are done in the US and then sold into markets. Um, and then I think a third point that I wanted to, to mention in terms of mobility of data, mobility of blood sometimes, um, is, is really about governance, which Natalia also referred back to. A lot of the times, I think we're unable to actually put in place um, enough legislations that um, pay attention to what is actually happening beyond the software in the invisible realm. Um, and I guess it's that opacity that is really hard to access. So I think from a research standpoint and research methodology, there's a lot of complexity to sort of have to go around in terms of who's gonna actually give you access to, and what kind of questions, if they give you access, will you kind of engage with them with? Um, so those are some of the initial thoughts and yeah, really excited to, to keep the conversation. All right, thank you so much, Amina. 
We'll move on to Maya from Arus. I suppose you are in Denmark, right? You have to unmute. Yes, you. yes. Thank you, thank you very much, and and thank you so much for this uh, invitation. Yes, I am in the Aarhus in Denmark, and um, I'm an anthropologist working in the Department of Educational Anthropology, and we have a we have a research program called Future Technology, Culture, and Learning Processes, and we are several anthropologists and other STS researchers who are conducting ethnographic studies, mostly in, in Denmark, but also with a global outlook, um, doing studies of workplaces, technology companies, schools, universities, and, and hospitals, and often with uh, emerging digital technologies, but not exclusively. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, at um at the moment i'm i'm starting a, a comparative research project with three ethnographic case studies in denmark in where um new ai applications are being developed for hospital settings and for schools for primary school education and in uh, in urban planning in in smart water systems and and then i i want to compare as you say that that ai is actually many many different things and to see how um, professional ethics, identities, and values may be displaced by AI. So big, the big question really is, is, is AI something new, or is it just a continuation of processes of standardization, for example, that we've seen for a long time? And also when it comes to to governance is may may this be a new kind of neoliberalization where, for example, ideas of professions are being displaced, um, and how are people in in different uh, social roles prepared to deal with these new technologies as as doctors, as teachers, as parents, and so on, um, and and in another project I am conducting research with my own students together with colleagues, how students of um, educational anthropology use large language models when they learn anthropology. And that's also really interesting to see how our own expertise as uh, university professors and as anthropologists is changing. And that was one of the questions that you posed. Um, and, um, I'm engaged with uh, colleagues from from other disciplines in my university, and we have a a, a reading group. And just uh, this morning, I read some research papers on how uh, large language models can support uh, qualitative research, auto code interviews, and so on. Uh, use uh, Chat GPT to to uh, to prompt our own uh, material, ethnographic material or maybe even create hip hypothetical scenarios. So you don't have to go out into the world to do ethnographic research. You can just ask large language models, what, what would a social scenario look like? And that really scared me a bit in relation to our own profession's uh, future, um, because everything is you know speeding up. Can we do research faster? Um, <laughs> Do we do we really still have to to go out and and do all the uncomfortable stuff in the real world? Um, and is um, like human experience really being displaced? And also um, is um, the deeply embedded, socially and culturally embedded anthropological interest being displaced by by more positive and positivist and and quantitative research ideals and so on and and I think Leah mentioned that our that we should develop our field methods and I I completely agree with that but I think also it's it's interesting to to really understand what what is going on with our discipline and how how is the new generation of anthropology students learning anthropology um, with these new digital tools. Okay, Maya, thank you very much. Yeah, that I think that's precisely what was meant by that question. The fact that the the bottom line, the basis of our work is interpersonal connections, right? And relations. We 
we talk, we go to the places, we stay there with people. And, and one of the things that I think is being discussed, well, already for quite a while, is the fact that anthropological work or ethnographical work is normally a long term thing, right? You go and you stay with people or you do long term interviews and for a while. And all this artificial intelligence actually can supposedly give you answers really quick. So it it surpasses us, right? It, you know, you write a few things and ask ChatGPT and ChatGPT writes a paper and you take two months to write that paper. But still, I think that what we're handling here is that there is a difference of quality and, and of approach uh, between AI and real humans, right? But I don't know. One, one thing that always uh, strikes me is when you go into no matter which site and it gives you those words or numbers so that you can prove that you are a human. And did that, the other day I was entering, I don't know, whichever site, and it asked me to a very to do a very complicated kind of game with a little person that I was moving from place to place. And then after doing that four or five times, the site said, okay, you are a person. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious <laughs> because I felt I was not a person doing that. It was like a very automatic type of of uh, of logic. But well, the, the, the site or the the network told me I was a person. So I said, okay, okay, so I'm, okay, I'm a person. Anyway, but let's move on with this. So we, now we have Aza, whom I, I don't know if you are right now in um, in South Africa or where you are, but I, once again, I thank you very much because you are in Ramadan and you are here with us as well. So thank you so much, Aza, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, yeah, I'm I'm actually currently in Dubai, so um, it's like uh, it's after it's past six o'clock and people now are breaking the fast. So <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's okay. Um, uh, I would have preferred to put off my screen, but um, now I think it's better. So if a couple of you could do that because of my uh, internet uh, connection is not stable, it would be helpful. So I could have my screen on. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, the 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 question of if AI potentially scary, I think it's 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 a sort of a subjective, you know, question, and or it depends on the context. Context is very important when we try to sort of think of how scary AI is. Um, there are contexts that for me are more scary than others, especially when AI is deployed in places where it's meant to be as as a test you know as a as we are just testing this AI it's not yet secure we don't know what's the outcomes what how this AI is going to impact you know the the society which just we're just testing it there so in this case I think it's really scary and and we we do have to be concerned um also what concerns me is You have frozen. When Aza, we cannot hear you very well. Your your voice is coming out cut, you know, in pieces. You know, like an obsession with other with a lot. Aza, can you hear me? Aza? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm back. <laughs> oh, you're yes. back, yeah, because for, for a while yes, there, you, were, you were being cut. We could not really understand what you're uh, saying. Oh, uh, sorry. Part, so I was, was, yes, so what I was saying is that we should be concerned when, when we talk about, when, you know, we talk about AI because, um, AI, is, as I said, it's subjective, but it's also um, sort of, you know, like um, the way we should be concerned is the way it's, de it's deployed, you know, like if it's deployed in a context where there's no regulations, um, deployed in a context where it's a, it's a technology that we want to test, you know, it's not a technology that's already established, that there's already research out there, and we know that, you know, the, the pros and cons, but 
it, when it goes as testing, you know, and, and, and then it creates all those obsessions of efficiency, obsessions of access to health, um, obsession, obsession even on privacy, you know, like AI is also used, there's an obsession of AI that could, you know, bring more privacy. That's, and that's, I find very ironic. And also, um, you know, like one of the things that also we should be concerned about is when AI become autonomous, you know, have autonomous decisions. And, and there was recently I was looking, I was looking at uh, the news and there was something very interesting I saw. I mean, people made it funny because on social media, but it's really, it, it, it is concerning, you know, in many ways that, for example, there was this robot that um, Saudi Arabia, you know, launched a, co a company in Saudi Arabia that launched that robot. And it was the first uh, male robot that's, and his name, I forgot the name of the robot, Ali something. And it was interesting because there was, um, there was two reporters, one, the, the man and a woman reporter, they were both talking about the, the, the robot. And then suddenly the hand of the robot moved, you know, and touched the woman inappropriately. And immediately it just went, the, the video went viral on social media. They were talking about it, like how, what, if, if this is really, uh, you know, like an autonomous decision of the robot to, you know, to, to move his hands and inappropriately touch the, the reporter, or if this is uh, just, you know, just a coincidence. And, and it brings us to the discussion of uh, autonomous, you know, like it's, 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 auto it's uh, autonomous. Does that mean there's going to be any human responsibility or are we going to uh, take the robot, you know, to court, you know, so <laughs> or something like that, if, if, if it's necessary to proceed in that way. And I think it's, there's a lot of risks and we have to be aware of. And it's it is it is scary in a way, you know, like um as I said, um and for example, if you want to talk about uh like anthropologists and anthropology and how um um we have it like we have we do have valid reasons to be concerned, we do have uh, valid reasons to be concerned about our discipline, how we are going to do anthropology in the future. It's there's a lot of software out there out there. You know, I remember that when I started to do my research, I was using uh, softwares like Atlas, and then I got a bit sophisticated. I went and learned uh, Max R. But now I see like there's a lot of softwares out there that are powered by AI. So in case of data analysis, even if you go to the field, you see it, you collect, you want to deal with all that huge amount of data, you need to um, transcribe, you need to do all those things. And and you have very short time to do research. You know, this is also one of the things like the more the technology is, is advancing, the more there's also a lot of, um, a lot of like um, obligations, you know, obligation that you finish on time, because if you don't finish on time, your funding will be cut or the obligation of, um, yes, you have to publish, you have to be visible, you have to all, like all these kind of things. And these things now are done by AI you know, to, to speed up the process. Because now, as, as people are also um, obsessed with efficiency, they're also obsessed with, you know, like speed. So, um, yeah, this is where I, I, I could, yeah, I was going to stop here and maybe just continue with the, with, the, with the rest of the second round or we could have this, uh, like some sort of, yeah, you know, like conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aza. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm back here. Actually, your internet was not so bad, Aza, except for that little two minutes where you were really cut, but then it came back again. So we are going to start the second round. I don't know if you want to add anything further to what you've said before or whether you want to start commenting on each other's inputs. Uh, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want. But so I'll give the floor to Leah again. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, there were a lot of really, really interesting points raised. And um, one of them, um, so Maya, I think, was saying uh, the question about um, our experience as anthropologists potentially being misplaced. And I think it's a really important question to be thinking about. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, we are um, 
already very much operating within the digital. There's um, AI is an extension of that. Um, but I think it's also it's it's an it's a time for us as anthropologists to really push towards pace. Was mentioned a, a few times to um, try and create sort of a counterweight to that. So at the moment, I'm as was mentioned, I'm doing some consulting work. So a lot of my thinking comes from all of these very sometimes very disorienting engagements with different kinds of stakeholders and kind of trying to position myself in these all of these spaces as an anthropologist and trying to you know um bring in uh, translate really between different different interests and trying to stand my own ground as an anthropologist which which is challenging but i think it's an important task um in for anthropologists in some ways to try and broaden the discussion um and because there's not that many um so i've been asked lately a lot to recommend people um for contributions of volumes um or whatever you know um about artificial intelligence and generative ai and i keep thinking about anthropologists and uh, but the timelines are timelines are sometimes really crazy nobody's going to make uh, do an ethnography within this timeline um so for me i think and something that's really important to me is um i think for, for lack of a better word it's like for us to for us or for for there to be a critical digital um literacy like a different way of thinking about that not just sort of as people developing specific skill sets but you're not working towards a broader sort of social awareness um of both you know the opportunities and the risks of tech because we live in a in a tech world that's not gonna we're not gonna reverse that um and yeah i think because it's not just you know, certain geographic regions that are really left out of the discourse all the time. Um, it's it's people who use the technology and everyday experiences um, that are not part of the discourse of regulating and, you know, all of that th that was mentioned. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really important in um, figuring out how AI can actually be made useful and just if if there is a way to make it just or more just and less risky in any case. So I think that means bringing people into the conversation, you know, ordinary, your ordinary Josephine, um, elderly citizen, everyone. Um, and yeah, I think for that to do that, we have to think about digital literacy as something that isn't a privilege or sort of an extracurricular activity to invest in. Um, in your free time, um, I mean, I'm talking about people in general, but something that is really crucial in working towards digitization practices um, for people rather than for profit. Um, and I do see um, spaces like IUAS and, and WOW as important platforms and, you know, bringing together scholars from all over the place and utilizing different networks and different ways of thinking um, to give these conversations direction. Um, and I think that that can do something. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much once again, Leah. So Natalia, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to start Responding one of the Q&A questions from Virginia Dominguez, what is exactly AI? And I really like one definition I heard in a podcast, The Data Fix with Dr. Mera Hogan. And she was discussing how any system that collects, analyzes, pre-processes, and learns from big data is artificial intelligence. And that definition takes us from a smart meter passing through a captcha to the algorithms processing, for example, the images of the James Webb telescope. From a material perspective, it's super important to have a broad view on these types of technologies to maintain the history, the economy, 
and the politics of the technologies. And in this same context, it's important to problematize how artificial intelligence intelligence was invented, what well, wasn't invented with ChatGTP. Artificial intelligence has existed for decades, and anthropologists have actually been studying artificial intelligence for decades, even even the even in the dark ages before the current boom of these technologies. And also the discussion made me wonder how specifically AI affects the discipline and taking the words of some of you at the end affects the topics of research, the methods and the ethics. And the emergence of this technology is a call to research it critically. And one entryway is computational methods. And I suggest taking the work of our Danish colleagues that have made amazing work on this specific topic. And there's a fascinating special issue actually in big data and society called machine anthropology, where you can get more profound reflections and apply cases on how this specific view affects how we approach our topics of research. And also, there, this is a moment when it's not only about computational methods, it's also how it affects our research topics. And I think, personally, that having an anthropological study on social media, telecommunications, IoT, smart cities, and more, without including even a small paragraph on AI, big data algorithms, and information circulation, is missing an essential dimension in contemporary societies. So my invitation is just to read more. There's plenty of things coming up, even every single day, because in the case of artificial intelligence, the academic community has been super engaged in studying it critically. Thank you so much. Oops. Uh, sorry, I, I was <laughs> thinking I was unmuting myself, but I was actually muting myself. Thank you so much, Natalia. So, uh, Mina? Yeah, I, I have so many thoughts. Um, and one of them uh, really has to do with thinking of the circuits of, of technology. So I've been really interested in kind of, um, you know, still asking questions about data colonialism and the relationship between France and Morocco, for instance, Morocco being a post-colony of France and how many technologies exist in Morocco that are built um, in France and how much of our algorithmic infrastructure is actually made up of technologies that come from there. And I think it's it's been really interesting to kind of um, observe like a shift of power um, with, with political alliances um, come new opportunities for governments. So I think it's been interesting to see where are uh, commodities or smart commodities or technologies coming from and how is that subverting the order um the world order or order of things um but also what kind of new modes of extraction are taking place um and is is it a continuation of past colonial sort of um expansion when now instead of going there with your military um Africa is still a lab. I mean, I mean, Africa could for them still be considered as a laboratory and with the lack of governance and legislations, all that data is moving without um, without surveillance. Um, and eventually you we. Yeah, I think I really want to stress on the opacity parts, which which I did earlier. Um, but to go back to also Virginia's question, um, I also watched a really interesting talk on um, feminist AI, um, and one of the speakers was really talking about face recognition, the technologies that are used by the Israeli military to um, recognize and pro profile um, Palestinian journalists and to actually um, sort of code self-driven drones and autonomous drones um, to kill them. So I think it's it's really that kind of um it's those kind of things that are at stake and the surveillance um especially in mil militarization using ai has really gone out of hand and nobody can actually sort of speak to it mainly because it's um it's a huge market and everybody's involved in it um, but um yeah i think these are the two points um yeah that i wanted to share but i have some more thoughts in a bit
Thank you, Amina. So Maya, please. Just unmute myself. Hi. Yes, it's great to have this these discussions. And I was also thinking about uh, Virginia's question, what what counts as, as AI? And I was thinking we really need anthropological categories for different kinds of AI. And I um, so that it doesn't become like all the technological, technical explanations of different generations of AI and so on that we are trying to to understand. But that um, that AI can be many different things also in, in people's everyday perspectives, like uh, AI that runs in the background and is completely invisible or AI that that causes social anxieties or AI that that changes social relations or AI that is uh, considered useful and so on. So there I think we need an anthropological language to understand AI and um, yeah, I am in the field where I am working now. I have medical doctors who care for patients and teachers who care for education. They don't really care for AI. They might they might find these new tools useful, but it's just one one kind of of technology that they can use for teaching or for for um, diagnosis or care and so on. So that's uh, yeah. I think it it poses a challenge to us as anthropologists to to come up with these everyday experiences. And then, of course, I I think it's really interesting to see this as a post colonial expansion. Also, because I'm I'm thinking of my students who just said, ah, so um, Chat GPT is so American, and of course, <laughs> that means something different, uh, dependent on where we are positioned in in the world. But in the in in Northern Europe, uh, that would mean some kind of cultural homogenization of understandings. So uh, we asked our students to write essays about what is education. And of course, not surprisingly, the whole uh, framing of what education is, uh, is completely uh, cultural, not universal at all when you when you take a discussion with ChatGPT about what is education. And so so we really see this um, cultural homogenization when students are learning with chat gpt for example but of course this uh, colonial expansion means many different things and it would be really interesting to compare um, the research that i'm doing in a in a danish regional hospital with uh, research that is done in a, a hospital in morocco and south, south africa and different places so maybe we should take the opportunity to yeah do some more uh, comparative work to get wiser about what what is AI in all these different settings. Yeah, yeah. It, it, although I think your question is a very good one because I think you guys are all talking from a perspective of AI applied to very specific things such as health um, environments or other or education. But I don't know. I was just wondering whether when you when you're asking what is AI in different contexts, in different cultural contexts, in different societies, you are right. But on the other hand, I think most people that are ignorant of AI, like myself, I'm not I'm not in that in that area. So for me, it's it's something that I don't know much about. For me, it's something that is up in there in the in the virtual space. And that everybody can use, and in the sense that every well, when I say everybody, of course, it's an elite of the world that has access to all the the digital media, right, and internet, etc. But for all those who can use it, in in my ignorant opinion, it's something that is available equally to everyone. And what you're saying is that it's not, and I truly believe you. I, I think it's very that's very interesting. It's something I have never thought about. Okay, so Aza, please. Are you available? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I I really like what Maya was saying that um, to translate AI to our everyday experiences and what does it mean, you know, to to what does it mean, for example, if we are talking about AI as a as a 
program for complex decision making, you know, so what does that really mean in everyday life practices? Um, for example, if we if we send our resumes to um, an institution that use AI to sort, you know, CVs, and if you don't have the right, you know, words, keywords in your CV, you'll be eliminated, you know. So it's that's that's the bias of 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 AI, you know, and this is how and and this is how um, a lot of HR in a, uh, um, departments are making their decision you know they're letting the AI to make the decision to sort out the resumes for them then they will have those shortlisted ones who are they going to contact them but in that process a lot of people who would have been probably qualified to to have the job are excluded simply because they don't have the right resume the correct uh, format of the resume that the AI could recognize and make the decision on you know so this is one way to look at at how um, what does it mean when we say AI is about complex decision making, or where what does it mean when say AI is about adaptability and learning, or what does it mean if we say AI is, uh, for example, about um, yeah natural language processing and all those you know big jargons that we hear from you know, all those tech um, you know tech builders and. Um, yeah, so um, it's one of my one of my um, also concerns is that we don't have um, a common a common ground, not just among anthropologists, but also among different disciplines that we need to speak to. You know, we need to speak to lawyers. We need to speak to um, tech developers who are actually one of the in my. Uh, in my own experience is one of the hard people that you could talk to, you know, because they are really, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, few of them are, are are more open for discussions and especially, you know, like they are in, into bringing new disciplines like critical AI and all those things. But still, um, the general public, you know, they are more taken by the, the hype of, you know, of innovation, of the hype of, you know, having those, building those startups and imagining there will be the next, um, you know, rich people in the world. I mean, if you look at the, the most rich people in the world, they're all in the AI tech. So it's it's that, it's that you know, that promising end. And then it's, it's us who are trying to, you know, say like, it has to be responsible. It has to be included, include people. It has to be this and this and that it has to be ethical. So um, yeah, uh, it is it is challenging, but yeah, I hope like a lot of forums, like Leah mentioned, that this we create those spaces where we we could actually bring people together and talk, you know, and and not just talk, but really, you know, convince uh, people to to rethink, you know, and slow down, slow down um, the the whole process. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? It's kind of hard for people to slow down now because I think we're, you know, we're moving in a, in a in a pace at a pace that just, just goes and goes and goes. Okay, so we've had two rounds. Uh, one hour has gone by. Normally, the way we do this is we do exactly as we did now. We have one hour of uh, inputs from the participants, the guest speakers, and then we have half an hour for discussion. Normally, the webinars take one and a half hour. Uh, so I would like, the thing is that Ricardo is not here, and we have changed the models of Randy as far as exactly internet goes, which is not, as you understood, my speciality. I'm zero in IT and social networking, etc. So Previously in the webinars, we could see everyone who was attending and people now at this stage would start making questions from the audience and that we would discuss here and, you know, all of you could answer. Now, I don't see people participating and I don't see anyone asking any questions in the chat, so I'm kind of puzzled. Oh, Michelle, Claire. help? Uh, Claire, if you go up, you'll see a Q&A. Click on the Q&A and you'll see questions. A Q&A. Oh, yes. yes. Click on oh, that. So it's, it's not in the chat anymore. But so those are the questions people have asked. Okay. All right. I see them here. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. It's my IT ignorance. I thought they would be in the chat as usual. 
Okay. So basically in the chat, we always ask people to before, um, before writing that they would say where they came from. So because since we are a world anthropological union and we do have elements and and partners uh, and, and people in both associations, IUAS and WTA being uh, an organization of anthropological associations. We have associations from all over the world. We always ask people to write down where they come from, but well, some people do, some people don't. Anyway, we have a question here from, from Virginia Dominguez, our colleague from, from the US, uh, asking what exactly is AI? <laughs> I have the same question, Virginia. What is actually is AI? Amina talked about different kinds of things that get called AI, but could you all elaborate on what is AI and what gets it included and what, what gets included in the term AI? I must say, I totally subscribe um, what Virginia is asking because I'm not sure I know exactly what AI is. I mean, I have the knowledge that everybody has, but... I'm not, I'm not sure I know it. Okay, another question we have is, we have had digital tools to facilitate interpretation of ethnographic work. AI is now new enhanced way of, is now a new enhanced way of analyzing data. I think the question is how to use AI to enhance anthropological research, okay? Then if we move, Further down, I'll just I'll just read one more question and then we'll discuss this ones and then on, in the second round we'll discuss the next few ones. Otherwise, it's too many things. How do we create an equal playing field across the globe so that those in all countries will have access to AI capabilities? That AI is not just something used by anthropologists in the global north. Yeah, that that's one of the questions I was uh, touching upon before, which is not everyone in the world has the same access to internet and to all the AI technology. So, do you want to address this first three questions, or let me just check if I can? Uh, I'll I'll read one more since we have eight. I'll split it in two. Okay. So the fourth one is how can we? That's from Carlos Champi. How can we as anthropologists use AI in our daily basis or for research purposes? I've heard to talk about automatic codification or interviews transcription. What else could we take advantage of AI? Okay, does anyone want to start uh, with this? Yeah, Maya? So I, I'd like to say <laughs> I'd like to say something about these um, uh, techniques and if they can enhance anthropological thinking or anthropological analysis and I and I really think we should go with the slow. Uh, so, because why is it that we're doing um, anthropological field work and why is it that we're seeking human experiences? And I think that um, I am using. I am using AI to tran transcribe interviews. Um, that's I'm using a large language model to transcribe to transcribe interviews. But I would not uh, use uh, an AI to do automatic uh, coding of the material. And and also, what is the reasoning behind doing this? You can you can do more in less time. But is that really why we do qualitative research? Uh, so the one of the papers I read was then automatically annotating 2,000 interviews with, and that was with Rohingya uh, refugee children in Bangladesh. So the, it was really interesting topic and their uh, future um, ambitions. And but then it, the the AI was trained to code quotes from the interviews, whether this was a religious ambition or a secular ambition for example and uh, then that will all depend not on the context uh, of what is said but what is inside the text and I think this is really one of the reasons why we're doing field work and anthropological work is always to embed um, different social phenomena in in relevant with the relevant contexts and this was just a clear disembedding uh, of uh, interview material so 
of course, you could do that automatically annotate thousands of interviews if you train an AI to do it. But I think we should really ask ourselves why and does that, that, does that bring us closer to understanding the human condition? So does AI as a non-human device help us in understanding humans? <laughs> Basically, that's it, right. Okay, so Natalia? Thank you. I want to reply to the how, no, the how do we create an equal playing field across the globe for all, for those in all countries who have access to AI capabilities? I have a gloomy reply. We can't ensure complete access. What I have found in my research about the rollout of the 5G network in Chile is that connectivity comes with disconnection. In other words, when you create connection, you create this connection to the same system you want to connect. And as any other system relying on global supply chains, AI has embedded extraction and equal distribution of the outputs, hierarchies, for profit, capitalist logics, commodification, and more. Just let's think of water systems. Water is a basic need. Humans make it for profit. At the heart of the at the heart of any infrastructure is a need to control and extract. Now the talent for us as critical scholars on technology, and particularly if anyone else studies digital infrastructures, is to find when our ethnographic characterizations stop and we begin to have a stance on the matter. Many more questions arise when you do this exercise, this political exercise. For example, what can anthropology do to engage with big tech? Do we have to engage with big tech? Do we turn activists, for example? And can we, as a discipline, think, dream of a different technological world? I have no questions for for the for these questions, but it's something that if you study the systems, you have to make them constantly. Thank you, Na Natalia. Um, now let me see. Does anyone else in in the from the participants want to address these issues? Okay, I see Amina and Leah. Amina, please. Yes, um, I think just thinking about the same question that Natalia just responded to, but largely from a different um, pers perspective or from how I understood it, um, th th that AI is not just something used by anthropologists in the global north. And it's interesting that um, I think as a discipline, anthropology, and this is like a, a method slash research, research methods answer. Um, a lot of countries and spaces have been tattooed with particular thematics that brown scholars are supposed to research. So when I started doing my research in Morocco and telling people, oh, you know, I'm trying to look for AI. And they're like, oh, why can't you research about Islam? Why can't you research about women's oppression? Why can't you research about tribal settings? We don't have AI. And I think that's the particular um, confusion that happens is that particular texts have frozen particular specialities in time and have contributed to the stag of there is no Western modernity flash in, in those spaces. But I think it's really um, important to go um, to, to either our own countries or to different spaces and actually come in with criticality and understand the labor um, the labor conditions that um, people are are enduring to serve um, technologies that they're not actually benefiting from but that they are being kind of um, sort of using their bodies to, to make them work and so yeah I think I just wanted to pinpoint to this misconception about, where AI is and where it isn't, um, because I think we can find it pretty much everywhere. Um, read data centers. There's really incredible work being done on data centers. I think in um, uh, not Cuba, but I'll find the country and I'll and I'll send you the article on the chats. Um, but it's really how do. Um, employees in data centers interact with one another and what does it mean for them to maintain the cloud that we often think is something invisible, intangible, but that is rather very much physical and draining um, resources in different parts of the world. 
Um, so I think there are different entry points to the topic. It's not necessarily touching the technology, feeling it, but yeah. Yeah, Leah, you were in line to say something, please. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to build on what Amina said um, also because it, it reminded me of my own research in um, Mozambique um, where I went and... Um, to see what the role of AI is in, in healthcare and asking people um, in, in a big hospital, um, it was also the training hospital for uh, medical students. And I was told, AI, why, why are you looking at AI? This is not relevant here. Um, just to then realize there, were, there was AI being used, there were applications like um, comparing radiology images that were being used, they were just not considered AI. There was a different kind of image attached to that. Also, I think very much shaped by development um, narratives and, you know, broader narratives that people are not invited to shape. And that's the other thing that Amina was um, also touching on that, I mean, how to create a level playing field, it's, it's a hard question, but I mean, diversifying rooms where decisions are made, that's, it's a big, it's not an easy, you know, there's no simple solution to that, but without that, and I mean, that's decisions across the value chain, um, you know, um, in the whole process. Um, yeah, that's, you know, um, and amplifying the research that is being done that, captures more diverse perspectives because there is research, but you don't find them in the big volumes that are being published and not necessarily included there. So those, those are the two things. All right, thank you, Leah. Um, now let's move on to some more questions. There's a comment from Yasmin. Well, it, no, it's a question actually that I share with her. What are the ethical considerations that should be taken into account when integrating AI into human sciences from an anthropological perspective? Of course, this is a, once again, a very broad question because ethical issues are all around us, right? And also with AI, I was just thinking of a project I'm doing where Leah is also part of uh, on digital death and, and the use of AI, for instance, to create chatbots so that people can communicate with the dead ones. And, and 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 therefore help possibly potentially help them in grief through the grief process, right? Of course, this has different sides to it because it depends on people. Because fortunately, we are not robots; <laughs> we are humans, and so humans have different emotional reactions. So for some people, this may be useful. It may be actually a good thing because it might help them get through the griefing process. For others, it will be considered morbid and awful. So, and, and, and of course, just this, this example that I'm giving here, this project that I'm engaging in, uh, has so many ethical considerations. All, all, the, all the stuff around death that stays in the virtual world after people depart and how others and even artificial intelligence may use the, that data or those conversations, those interactions to produce something produced exactly by AI. AI. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, like I said, I'm not at all into into this. I don't. I don't know the basics about AI, but still, it's a question that concerns me. Concerns me. The ethical questions that Yasmin is asking about here, and that I'm sure can worry a lot of people. Another question. Actually, and it's not a question, it's a comment from Mary Helen, which I share. She says, it seems that what's happening with AI, it's the same process of using, and it's a, it's a, it's a same type of process that happened when computers were made and adopted. That is, well, I think what she's saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is we had a lot of issues and discussions when computers came about um, and we started using them which are a bit similar to what we're discussing here nowadays. Now you're all much younger, so you don't remember when computers came around because computers were here when you were born. But I can tell you they weren't here when I was born. I did my BA thesis on a typewriter and it was only when I went to the States to do my master's that computers were starting to be used. So, and I had a lot of problems. I, I lost a lot of things because I didn't know how it worked. So 
it's a bit kind of the same thing that happened 40 years ago. So, okay, uh, Francine Sayan, what about, she asked, what about the use of anthropological material by AI and not how we use it, okay? Then somebody else asks, should we fear a dehumanization of anthropological and sociological studies with the exploitation of AI in our work? Will we always be able to control the expansion of these technologies? Please don't feel like you all have to answer these questions. These are just, you know, uh, comments and interaction between everybody who's um, listening to us. And, and so it, it's the idea is to trigger more discussion. And of course, it's endless. We could stay here for hours. Now, Ed. Ed Libo says, thanks to all of you for your thoughtful commentary. This question is for Maya in particular about automated aids to research methods. In my opinion, multi-sided-team-based ethnographic collection has a significant problem with inter-rater reliability when it comes to coding field notes. I'm curious as to whether Maya shares this opinion and whether in the instance of teams of interviewers and coders, whether an automated approach to coding field notes dash interview transcripts might help address this reliability problem. So we have three questions basically and two comments. Does anyone want to start? Maya, do you want to start addressing this? Um, oh, and oh, we have a lot more questions. Let, let's just address this ones and then we'll go into the two last ones. I just want to say very briefly that I'm I'm not so concerned with this because I'm not so concerned with objectivity in anthropological research. Uh, I'm much more concerned with um, posi positionality of of uh, knowledge. Where does where does knowledge come from? So and and to make that transparent when we do ethnographic work. So the whole ambition of of not having bias and being unbiased, I think that's impossible. And it's inherent in our in our discipline that we have to reflect on on bias and positionality all, all the time. So I think it's it's wrecking our discipline a little bit to think along these lines um, and to forget where knowledge comes from. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Thank you so much, Maya. What about the rest of the questions? Well, there's the question of ethical considerations, which I think you've all more or less sort of already addressed in some way or another. But there's also the, this question then that, that I find interesting. Should we fear a dehumanization of anthropological and sociological studies with the exploitation of AI in our work? But there was Natalia Nazo that wanted to say something, I assume, uh, concerning the uh, the, the issue that Maya just discussed. So please, uh, Natalia. Asa was first. I'm sorry, Asa, please. I, d I didn't, I didn't <laughs> check who left. Who yeah. left. Uh, no, it's fine. It's okay. Um, so there's the question that if AI uses our own data, and I think we still didn't reach that level where, you know, like you wake up and you find like an AI submitted an article on your behalf <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, that happened in movies, in mo futuristic movies where the AI took the liberty of, uh, you know, writing for the writer and submitting articles and the writer got prizes because of the AI submitting the articles, but we are not still there, you know, you still, there's still a level of command, you know, that, that you do, you know, even if you, submit an article that you never wrote, you know, there's still a level of command that you go through ChatGPT or any of those platforms and 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 command, you know, that that um particular AI to write that article, you know. So it's not it's not we are not yet there, but it's also a question of thinking of um um to what extent are we going to um you know Blame. Are we going to blame AI? Are we going to blame the humans who are making the AI? You know, like especially when we talk about autonomous decision making, because AI is doing a lot of autonomous decision making. You know, it's just not that one that's you know that's extreme. You know, but it's still doing a lot of autonomous decision making, and we have to um, see of and and really consider. And um, are we going to 
you know like because a lot of a lot of a lot of um um ai developers would say well we 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 did the development but this is how it's learning you know it's and this is this is not our responsibility we'll step back but it is their responsibility in a way and we need to figure out how we share responsibility of ai technology you know um uh, going wrong you know this is this is a very important thing and i think it's valid to ask the question if ai is going to take one day our data and publish on our behalf yeah thank you Thank you, Aza. Natalia? Yeah, I just want to, wanted to follow back to the ethical questions because I imagine that many people are just starting to go into these topics. And one starting point is the ethical discussions in the Association of Internet Researchers 2019 ethical guidelines. And what they do is that they follow the nuances of digital big data and AI ethics applied specifically for social research. And, and you can see in that in that text that they make a really good job in delving into the tensions between informed consents, a core device in social research, and data availability through big data. So it's quite interesting how they put different strategies to have as guiding principles, for example, data minimization to do not make harm to other people, and also, uh, for example, care as a guiding another guiding principle to have a good digital ethics. And what I really like also about the, the text is that it opens up the conversation while also guiding and focalizing the discussion with literature suggestions. So I suggest taking that, that text. Uh, it's super pedagogical and I'm very sorry for the self-reference, but also in the journal where I work in big data and society, you can check the latest discussions on these topics. Like for example, the terms are conditions on the platform and how they can create a specific tension with the users, how there are different regulations on these topics and how many countries are making different politics and how you can have a, a broad view to make or to analyze them comparatively to see and propose a different view on the ethics. That's it. Okay, thank you. Now we have another question here from Virginia. She's asking, is it chat GPT that has promoted AI and made it look like something new? In US universities, the concern is that students might submit to instructors papers they didn't really write, which, which is, brings us back to the ethical questions of using AI, right? And how, mu how much can you go into it without being unethical, right? Then we have... I don't know if you guys want to answer this, but then there's another long comment from Marijinella Mihai. She says she's a, an anthropologist working as uh, in data engineering in LLMS and Gen AI, Western Washington University. And she says, I find that big tech is considering the default user to be the global North user. And judging by the bias introduced in the models every day at granular levels, we can say that the default user is the white middle class, able-bodied, straight American, probably men. I also find that this tech spaces desperately need social scientists on their teams. I think we all agree on that. Um, <clears throat> and she says, uh, although they don't quite understand this or they don't want to understand or they don't want to accept it. How can we as anthropologists adapt to the fast and dynamic pace of AI development in a way in which we do not just thoroughly study these processes and then communicate foregone conclusions? How can we apply our knowledge timely in ways that shift the conversation, but most importantly, the practices of such enterprises? I don't know why, but I cannot go down in the Q&A, so I cannot read the rest of the question, but that's basically the gist of it. So I think that these two questions, uh, Virginia Dominguez on the, the, pro the problems of ethics and of people using chat GPT, you know, I mean, you're trying to write a paper and you, you like I said before, and you spend months on that and you put it in chat, chat GPT and you, I don't know, I've never done it, but you probably have a paper done in half an hour or 15 minutes or even less, right? So how, I mean, this is the academic world, of course, but how do we deal with this? Maya? 
Yes, and this will also go full circle because why do we still have to read student papers when we can have uh, LLMs read them for us, right? So <laughs> there's just more and more text produced without nobody, without anyone having time to read it and think about it. Yeah, and also all the while we're doing this, we are losing the ability to think deeply about anything. So that's what really worries me is that we yeah we lose the ability to concentrate, so, right? And Naya, if, if where, we do not... we stop? where do we stop? I mean, if if it yeah. goes on and on and you say, okay, the students generate AI papers and we use AI to read them. So what's our yeah. role? Our, when I'm not just saying as professors, I'm talking, what is what is the human role going to become? Uh, I, I I don't know. It's it just, I, I was thinking, I don't know if you guys ever watched the series that was on, on I, I don't think it was on Netflix. I don't know where it was. I saw it. It was called The Feed. It was a British series called The Feed. And it was exactly about a world, uh, well, it's science fiction, but what really happens, I think, is that we've all seen that everything, that's why it's called science fiction, is that what was science fiction 15 years ago is now reality, right? So in this science fiction series that was on about two years ago, during COVID, I think, it was a fictitious world where actually the feed was a sort of a chip that, you know, body enhancing enhancement techniques, where a chip was put into the children when they were born. And so they would communicate with AI without even having to carry, uh, you know, uh, um, Androids or, or, or phones, iPhones or computers, because everything would be communicated through the mind, but not the mind, the chip that was in, in the head and that would make people connect to everything. And, but that, of course, it was a bit of a, of a, all well type of scenario where everything was controlled because of course the enterprise that made these chips and that controlled everything put the chips into the children when they were born so the ones that did not want to do that or have their children go through that process and wanted to to remain humans with all the problems that being human brings they were chased after right so the whole plot was around this and all these scenarios i think that were science fiction are now here and I don't. I don't. I honestly don't know how to judge whether it's good or bad. I don't. But you guys are specialists on AI. I'm not. So, would you like to expand a bit more on this? Um. Sorry, maybe I'll say something. I I just took the liberty. I saw my hand is up, and there's no other hands. Yeah, please, so please, please. I just take the liberty. I was, try I was add, trying. I was trying to read some more questions, but okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I think one of the things that we have to um explore is that and 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 see because i had i had i i don't remember where i read it but i read it somewhere that um ai needs original content you know to develop to evolve and to be smarter and smarter so if ai starts just consuming the same you know um content it generates at some point it collapses you know, because it's just starting to consume itself. So there is a need for original uh, content to be always produced. And this is why all those, you know, uh, platforms are out there for people to sing, people to dance, people to tell their stories, people to, you know, like TikTok, um, like all those, you know, those where, where there's a lot of content creators. And this is what's actually also imagined that the future is going to be like the future work is going to be content creating, you know. Like everyone is creating content in their different platforms. So so this is this is um um very a very important thing that we should consider because if students, like just to answer your question, if students started just to write with chat GBT and there's no originality anymore, chat GBT will not function. You know, at some point it will collapse. The whole system it will collapse. So, um, I mean, if we don't want to check ourselves, AI itself is going to, you know, check us. You know? <laughs> if we don't want to uh, regulate ourselves, you know, we will find ourselves at some point forced by AI to regulate, you know, what we are producing and what, you know, it's, it's just, it's just like that. So, um, yeah, that's that's my. Um... That's what I wanted to respond to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Anyone else? 
Um, yeah, I just wanted maybe more of a clarification because um, I, I don't know now who is that that the users of um, technologies like ChatGPT are pretty exclusively global north, or maybe I misunderstood the, uh, the statement or question. Maybe it was saying that um, the data is flowing from that because that that is true, but in um, the consumption of generative AI, there's, um, I'm working with projects that um, try to um, employ generative AI in, um, you know, low and middle resource settings, as they say. Um, and that's, yeah, as you can imagine, very problematic in different ways. I mean, we've touched on on some of these things, like mostly the idea of leapfrogging, um, jumping over, you know, structural, systemic uh, structural um, barriers through this this kind of idea of tech solutionism that an application will will fix everything, and but also the yeah, just like copying and pasting one technology, one um data set onto a different context which obviously uh, that that can't work um um yeah and the the other thing that was mentioned was um bias so one that's another thing that in in my work i found very 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 concerning that people tend to think of technologies as neutral and um they they are not they are the by the, the data that they are fed and they are inherently biased. So um, whenever I brought um, up the, uh, the topic of gender bias, for example, people were kind of shocked sometimes and people where you would think they, they are highly aware of that. So um, yeah, again, I think this is where anthropological work is, is important. Mm. Thank you, Leah. Well, uh, we've passed the one and a half hour. I don't know if we want to go on further discussing or if we should stop it here. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. We've more or less addressed everything, although it, it is complicated. I mean, I think that, let me try to summarize this. We've discussed a lot of the ethical questions surrounding AI and the fact that AI does seem to be uh, more available to the so so-called Western world, right? But I, I was thinking that one of the basic questions that was asked here uh, from Virginia Dominguez and myself was, "What is exactly AI? You know, what is it? What do we call AI? Just the capacity of some machinery, uh, man-built system, to engage intelligently on something, on 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 interaction, etc." Because I was just thinking, what I think it was Aza that was saying. If we stop producing information, the whole AI system would collapse, right? Because it needs to be fed by humans. But what hap What would happen if science fiction would become reality, as we see in many series and movies and, and books, of course, and AI would start generating its own, would auto auto feed itself, right? Would it be possible? I don't know. I know you're not, you know, none of you is into technical details of AI, but if this happened, which is, of course, as I was saying, the the basis of so many science fiction movies, etc., it would indeed kind of kill human creativity because the machines would take over. Not the machines, but that artificial intelligence would take over human intelligence. I don't know. Somehow, I don't think that this would be totally possible. Can you guys just expand on this as a sort of a close up uh, so that we close up in a science fiction mood. <laughs> of course, this has implications in anthropological work directly, but I was just thinking overall, but also as far as anthropology goes as discipline. Um, the way I, mean, I see or, or like to think about it is that it's very rare. I think what makes human brains um, very brilliant is our capacity to connect particular thematics that ordinarily like some people can connect better than others uh, let's put it that way and I think the beauty of reading other people's work is sitting with amazement at um, their brilliance 
And I think to what extent can you really be mind blown by a machine? Um, unless, I mean, I think at some point you'll get exhausted, but human beings keep like, um, keep surprising us and we keep surprising each other. And I think there's a human feeling of contentment um, when reading work that is produced by someone just like us. And I think there's also that, there's a bit of an aspirational um, human condition where you tell yourself, well, maybe I can do that too if I read so-and-so books and I'll be able to expand my mind um, in such ways. So when I do think of machines and softwares and robots taking over, I do consider it to, I would consider it to be a very sad place because will then be very locked into like prisons and unable to actually be free and, and unable to actually use um, art and fiction for what it does to us. Um, yeah, I think, and also I do feel like chat GPT can really produce like new ideas. As, as I said, it's just consuming itself. Um, so authenticity isn't really there and I think we need new ideas and I don't think technology will bring it. People who create technology have new ideas, but whether or not their technologies can reflect that is um, it's kind of a question mark. Yeah, yeah. and what, what you're saying exactly goes uh, in the same direction as a comment here on the Q&A section by Giovanna Guzlini when she says AI is extension of human intelligence. So what skills and competences do we need to be aware or to prepare for the future? Machines cannot replace the essential human skills. Have we thought about creativity, collaboration, curiosity, critical thinking? It's all you were talking about, Amina. Communication, social and emotional learning, these skills cannot be replaced by machines. So I think Giovanna's comment goes in the same direction as your comment, right? And then there's uh, Carlos Ciampi here says, does AI, he's, he is asking actually, does AI have a political position? For instance, I, do, I read a lot of people thought that chat GPT is tended to be progressive or it depends on the program or it depends on the information that is available in the internet, in the internet which yeah, I think that it can be manipulated, right? So does anyone want to expand more on this question of will AI substitute humans, <laughs> which is sort of the final comment that we were um, engaging in? I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> Natalia? I, I, I... Yeah, please. OK. <laughs> uh, so I think that AI won't replace us, but we just can't avoid it by 2024. I can avoid it because for example in my case I have to use Grammarly every time I write anything in English and that's a particular AI technology and I think that what we can do as anthropologists is that we can envision a different future and I think that a fascinating methodological discussion is how to decenter the present in anthropology and maybe questioning AI technologies already helps us to that exercise and makes us even more more engaged with technology development, not in a technical way, but in a social ethical way to consider the current, but also the possible features that the technology can create. And in that level, the question or the, the question about science fiction maybe can find a place in this type of perspectives. And particularly, always being critical about the materialities that underlie these type of systems. It's not only about the social impact, in the sense that when we use them and the technology is already created, but also how the technology was created, was designed, and ended up in our hands. Right. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Natalia. Does anyone want to say anything else or should we just close it here? We might have a second webinar one of these days on the same issue because I, I do feel there's so much going on on this issue that it's difficult to expand on everything in one and a half hour, but it's already one hour, 40 minutes we've been here. And um, as you all know, this has been, it has been recorded. So it will be available in the WOW website shortly, not today for sure, but within the next few days, I hope. 
So everyone that has not attended or that wants to hear this again can just go into the website and, and do it. And so I want to thank you all very much again for this. It was very interesting to have this uh, women webinar on artificial intelligence. Leah, you have your hand up. I don't know. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, I don't know yet. It's okay. I don't want to keep people. I just maybe very, very briefly, if it's okay. Sure, sure. Sorry. I didn't I think you lifted your hand right when I was starting to talk. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So uh, just to that last very important question of um whether AI will would substitute humans or replace humans. I don't think so. And I think um uh, Maya said also earlier something about technology being part of people's like uh, repertoires or that I and in my ethnographic work I also see that a lot of people never I mean never I shouldn't say never but people don't rely on one technology necessarily for one particular kind of outcome I'm thinking also um, about my uh, ethnographic work on um, tinder dating apps and um, how they were used in, in Cape Town and how people constantly grapple with this notion, with this question of authenticity, what is authentic using um, di digital technologies, what is real, but they find all kinds of strategies to find authentic connections, quote unquote. And that, yeah, that involves technologies like Tinder and other digital platforms, but also always other forms of of connecting it's it's yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's never just technology and i don't think yeah because we are humans and we need to connect right we need to connect not just with ai but with each other yeah and i don't think anyone really wants to just connect with ai and through ai right right yeah. okay well thank you so much for this one hour 45 minutes it was excellent it will be record it will be available as i said on the website and I thank you all very much again and wish you all a rest of a very great day or night or morning, depending on where you are. And thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.